Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we are on Topic 2, Lesson 1 on Visualizing Data. Topic 2, as you probably remember, is all about how we uh, describe data and data sets. One of the most important ways of doing that is visualizing data. I said earlier uh, that my approach to this course is supposed to be conceptual and visual. Here's the first part of the visual portion. All right. For this lesson and for many of the lessons uh, in this course, we are going to use a set of data from the father of American anthropology, Franz Boas, his immigrant data set. This is data on about 14,000 individuals that he reported on in 1912 in an article called Changes in Bodily Form of Descendants of Immigrants. He released these data in 1928 and they've been being used ever since. Uh, they are about the physical characteristics of immigrants, U.S. born uh, people versus their foreign born parents. The purpose of these data, <coughs> and the, <coughs> excuse me, the purpose of these data and the purpose of this study was to test race theory versus Boaz's culture theory. We go back to the beginning of this course. I talked about the, the basic fundamental questions of anthropology being ones of meaning versus ones of variation. And those variation questions are, why aren't everyone alike? <clears throat> why doesn't everybody do the same things? Okay. Race theory answered that question by saying, people don't do the same things and people aren't all alike because they are of different races. And in 1912, there is the beginning of what's called the synthesis in uh, evolutionary theory coming out of Darwin, 1848, uh, published on the origin of species by means of natural selection, I should say. Versus Boaz and other anthropologists' idea that people vary because of culture. Boaz uh, began his work in part because he was a Jew and discriminated against. Started out his work looking at race versus culture theory and it, at the turn of the century this was the big debate in anthropology. Does race explain variation or does culture? By looking at immigrants Boaz hoped to provide evidence that it's culture that best explains variation in, in this case, the physical makeup of people. When we look at these kinds of theories, we need to be concerned with two very specific aspects of them. One is whether or not they have warrant, and the other is whether or not they have evidence. Warrant means, is there an underlying body of knowledge out of which that theory comes and that it is consistent with and makes sense with? For race theory, that body of knowledge is evolution, evolutionary genetics, the modern synthesis that is just beginning to develop in evolutionary theory, at which explains variation based on genetics, based on uh, inherent physical properties. So it would make some sense that the physical properties of people could be explained by race, by this concept of race, a genetic characteristic or set of characteristics. The evidence for that was characteristics, and there was a huge amount of work done in early anthropology measuring things about human beings uh, from height to earlobes. Everything you can imagine was measured and being measured to give evidence for race theory. 
Culture theory, on the other hand, was based on this idea. People vary in their behaviors because of their cultures, which actually is not a very uh, clearly stated idea. In fact, being self-referential, it's actually not that great of a theory. The idea that physical behaviors could vary by um, culture really comes out of the idea that <coughs> physical characteristics can vary by environment. Uh, going all the way back to Darwin's finches and being on different islands and eating different foods created changes in the beak shape uh, of finches. So under that idea, culture as environment, as a cultural environment, there is good warrant for this concept that there might be physical differences based on culture. And the evidence is here. We're looking at the evidence that Boaz is trying to use to argue for his culture theory. And as we all know, culture theory won. Uh, this is one of the first big pieces of inf information or of evidence to give culture theory stronger warmth. Okay. First thing that we want to talk about is nominal data. Remember, nominal data have categories. They are discrete groupings, and those we can look at in tables and bar and pie graphs. That's how we can look at nominal data. So here's a set of tables, and you've seen these before. They should be fairly obvious. Here's uh, from Boaz's data, birthplace. In the data set we'll be looking at, there are 4,700 people who were born in the U.S. and roughly 8,000 people who were born in Europe. These are the parents of those U.S.-born people. That's called a frequency table. It shows us the basic frequencies, the numbers of those people, and it is a useful visualization of that information. Perhaps a better visualization and more useful because it gives us a sense of the actual ratios uh, or the actual comparative numbers in terms of the whole data set, how many people are in each category, um, is the percent table. And here we show percents of the whole data set of U.S. born, about 37% of the whole data set are U.S. born, about 63% are European born. We can see that from here, but to me at least, it's clearer to see the percentages. It makes it easier to look at. Another way to look at these data are through bar charts. On this bar chart, I'll just show you uh, I said there's about 14,000 cases in this data set. If you add up 4,000 and 8,000, it comes to about 12, a little over 12,000. Well, these are missing. They don't have data on this particular variable. So here you can see in the bar chart, these are foreign born, and there's a bar that shows how many there are. And remember, there are a little over 8,000, so here's 8,000, a little over 8,000. U.S. born, there was a little over 4,000, and so here we can see that. So this is a variable category, remember nominal variables, categorical, and the bar showing the number of people in that category. There are lots of other bar charts, uh, ways of visualizing data through bar charts. This is a very simple one, and we'll get at other ones later in the course. This is a pie chart. And what this is is a circle which pieces of that circle, like pieces of pi, represent the number of individuals or the number of cases with a given category. So here's U.S. born. And unfortunately, this is not showing up so well on this screen. The missing data are in this little pi, which is white. This is supposed to be pink. It's not showing up well for U.S. born. And foreign-born are in this blue. They represent, again, the, the numbers or the percentages. There is about 33 and 67 percentages uh, in each of those categories. Again, 
There are other ways to do uh, pie charts. These are, this is the very basic, simplest one. We'll get into others later. That's a lot of stuff quickly. We'll take a little break. Come back in a minute. So let's move on to how we visualize ordinal and interval data. Two basic ways that we can do that, and in fact with ordinal and interval data there are a lot of different uh, ways to visualize, but we're going to just look at two because they're the most commonly used and they're the ones that I prefer. I think they work best and I'm going to be using most in this course. Those are histograms and box plots. So here's a histogram, a very useful way of looking at uh, data, and we're going to have actually an entire lesson next time that's basically focused on histograms. But what we have here are the ages of people. This again is the BOAS data set. These are the ages of the individuals in that data set. The ages of individuals and the frequency or the number of individuals within a set of age categories. So these are five-year age categories. This little bar is zero to five, five to 10, 10 to 15, and 15 to 20. You might notice just by looking at this that most of the individuals in this data set, or at least a whole lot of them, are young, are under 20. And those tend to be the US born people because in 19, 10 when he was collecting these data, uh, the immigrants that he's looking at had only been in the U.S. a short period of time, their first generation, so their kids are all going to be relatively young. Then we can see that this goes up into the 80s. This is a very interesting histogram uh, we'll look at later. It's what's called bimodal. It has two modes. We'll talk about that in the next lesson. And it is also skewed right. And that's very common with histograms when you have an absolute starting point because you can't get younger than zero. But you can get really old. So this is skewed to the right, bimodal. But you can see what this histogram is. And I hope you can see how useful this is because you really get a good picture of the data of how the various groups are in the data in terms of their numbers. This is a box plot of the exact same data. So this is the age of individuals in the BOAS data set. What we've got here is this box represents the middle 50% of the population in this data set in terms of their age. This is the lower 25 percent to this what's called a whisker and this is the upper 75 percent of the this population so this is between 75 and 25th percentile and this is between the 50th percentiles. This little bar is the median. We'll talk about median next time. So these are representations of percentiles in a box plot or a box and whisker plot. In a box plot there are representations of percentiles versus counts in a histogram. That's really how they differ. These little dots are all outliers. We'll be talking about outliers later. In a lot of research we would get rid of these uh, on either side because they tend to skew what we're trying to look at, and remember this is right skewed, that's kind of why. These outliers, and they tend to be on both sides. 
Sometimes, in some research, we might want to look at those outliers. That might be what we're actually most interested in. And so it's nice that a uh, box plot actually shows us those outliers quite nicely. If we compare the two, I want to point out one thing. Here's the box plot, but what I've done is tipped it over 90 degrees. And this is the histogram. If you look at these and take this histogram and kind of tilt it on edge, that's sort of what the box plot is. So think of the box plot uh, as a representation of the histogram sort of tilted on edge. It's not exactly what's going on, but it is kind of that. You can see the median is sort of here. We'll get to median in two more lessons and exactly what it is. Here are the outliers, those really old people. So it's, it's a, a nice way to look at the, at the same set of data in two different visualizations, the histogram and the box plot. They're both very useful, and, and we'll see more why that is as we go through the course. Take another short break. We'll be back in a minute. Hi, and we are back. So, we're going to next look at visualizing relationships, that is, between several variables. We're going to do um, basic exploratory visualization lots of times. But in addition to that, and probably equivalent to that, we're going to be using visualizations to look at the relationships between variables. This jumps ahead in the course a little bit, but since we're talking about visualizations, I think it's helpful to do this here and we'll repeat it later on. So, if we want to look at relationships between two nominal variables, categorical variables, there are basically two ways to do that, and those are through contingency tables and cross tabs. The other one is through box plots, but I'm not going to show you that today. We'll get into that later on. We're going to use it extensively when we get into a statistical procedure called analysis of variance. With ordinal and interval data, box plots are very useful. And so are something that we haven't talked about yet called scatter plots. So let's take a look at each of these. Here are contingency tables. They're sometimes called cross tabs or cross tabulations because you're looking at tabulations across two variables. This is going to become really important when we talk about a statistical procedure called the chi-squared test, but that'll be towards the end of the course. If we look at a contingency table with frequencies, here we've got males and females, European-born and U.S.-born. You remember earlier we were looking at European born and US born and uh, talking about it at least um, and looking at a table just showing those numbers. Here now we've divided that between male and female, sorry, male and female. And we can see that there are about 4,500 European born females and about 2,500 U.S.-born females in the BOAS data set. Similarly, we can see that there are about 3,500 European-born males and about 2,200 U.S.-born males. As we talked about when we were looking at one variable frequency uh, tables, it's often much more uh, insightful or much easier to gain insight into what's going on by looking at percentages. And what I've got here is row percentages. One of the nice things about row percentages is you can read it left to right just sort of like you read uh, a page, a uh, text on a page. And here we can see that of females, 60% are European born, 40% are US born. That's roughly, I, I rounded those numbers. Uh, males, about 56% are Europe-born and about 40% percent, 
44% are U.S. born. What that tells us is that males and females are about equally represented in this data set in terms of whether they're European or U.S. born. So the percent tables are a nice way to look at relationships between two variables, especially if you're looking at row percentages, because then you can sort of just read it. You could also do column percentages. That's less useful, but you could then you'd look at, of European born, how many are female and how many are male. Typically, we're going to get to, um, to this later on. We have the variable of interest in the left column. We can also do this with a box plot. So in this case, because I have ordinal data or interval data, I have to have, I can't use U.S. born, foreign born, or male and female because um, that is an interval data, right? It's nominal data. So here I've changed to using stature, height, how tall people are in centimeters. So we have females and males. And this is how um, nominal data can be visualized in a box plot. You need uh, nominal data or low number of category ordinal data to look at a box plot because what you've got in comparing variables with a box plot is you've got a interval or ordinal variable um, forming the box plot itself and then you divide it up into categories based on some or, uh, nominal data or nominal variable or an ordinal variable with only a few ordinal categories. So what do we see here? Well, Remember, this is the middle 50%, the 25th percentile, 75th percentile, and then outliers. And what we can see here is that males and females in this particular data set actually are about the same height. We might not expect that, right? Because males tend to be taller than females. That's an idea that has warrant, right? The, because of all kinds of science on growth and development and that there's a modest, what's called sexual dimorphism between males and females in human populations and there's lots of evidence for it. So that's a reasonable idea. It's sort of contradicted here. And we'll look next at why that is but remember the number of individuals of the different age groups that we looked at in, a, in the histogram a little bit earlier. We do see, however, that the outliers are much, sorry, the, the outliers began very small. So, that would suggest, in fact, kind of the opposite of what we, would, what we would think is going on, in that we would think that there would be outliers in height for men. But that's not the case here. Again, we'll look at why that is. The one thing that does seem to follow that general idea that men are taller than women is if we look at the median. The median here is taller. Men are taller in terms of the median and the 50th, uh, the middle 50% gets a little taller. Okay, what's going on here? Well, here's a scatter plot. In a scatter plot, we have two variables that are both interval or ordinal. Ordinal scatter plots look a little weird, and, and we will look at some in this course. Um, but two interval variables compared to one another. Uh, for uh, the scatter plot is a great way to visualize that relationship. And if we look at this, we see something that's really odd. This is a very strange looking scatter plot. What's going on here? Well, this individual, let's say, it, this is a single case. That person 
is 21 years old and is about 90 centimeters tall. That's how we look at this. We look at this individual. That individual, we go down to the x-axis. They're about 50 years old. They are oh, 140 centimeters tall. This individual is about 40 years old, and they're tall, 180 centimeters or so tall. So that's how what each of these little points is where that individual sits in terms of their age and their stature. This dark cloud of points that is lots of these roughly 13,000 individuals all clouded together. And what we're seeing here with this flat cloud of points is that once you reach a certain age, you tend to be in a very limited range of height. So once you get to about here, or about 20, you don't grow any taller, and basically everybody is in the kind of same range of height. Now, if we were to look at just this cloud of adults, then we would probably find that women are a little bit shorter than men. There's a tendency for that, and we will look at that later on as we talk more about visualizations later in the course, because that's a very interesting uh, visualization to look at. Um, when we look at this, these are people growing up. They begin really teeny, and as they grow, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. What's going on here then is we really have two different patterns on this one scatter plot, and that's really interesting that we're seeing really two different patterns. This is a growth pattern, and then this is adults. When we want to work with these data, we actually probably want to separate these out. We probably want to just look at adults and just look at kids growing up, because this pattern, if we're, if we're interested in height or stature, that's really sort of concatenating two different things. And we're, we would find that men and women tend to grow similarly, but then women stop and, and end up a little bit shorter than men. And again, we will look at that when we can actually examine it more um, specifically. Anyway, scatter plots, as you can see, are a great way of visualizing a relationship between two variables. Okay gone through visualizations of nominal and ordinal data uh, and talked about box plots, scatter plots, uh, bar charts, pie charts, and tables, um, and most important, histograms. We're going to be talking about histograms in detail in the next lesson. I'll see you then.